Okay guys, so this is a Proton or HNMR uh, part one. I'm gonna do a, a second one after this, which talks about how you would answer a more difficult, longer question with NMR. Also, I have a video I've already made on this, which explains how an NMR machine works. <clears throat> so, if you want to know how it works, watch that video first, and then this is explaining how you get the different uh, peaks on your graph. So how to uh, know what to expect uh, from a molecule on a proton NMR graph, okay? So uh, what I've got is here, I've got a molecule, this is a propanol, and all I'm gonna do is go through how you would figure out what propanol would look like on a proton NMR graph, basically. So the method I would use is called the ribbon method. What you need to do is circle each of your different hydrogen environments. So these three hydrogens here, these are all in the same environment. So I'm just going to put a little circle around them and a little ribbon falling down. These two hydrogens, they get their own environment. So uh, they get a little ribbon too. And also I've got this hydrogen at the end there. So that's going to fall down there too. So step one, you've got to figure out all of your different hydrogen environments. Be really careful to make sure that um, you notice if two different hydrogens are in the same environment. Because sometimes hydrogens on different carbons can still be in the same environment if you've got a symmetrical molecule. And we'll do an example of one of those later. So I've got my three ribbons. The first thing we need to figure out about each of these environments is where they would show up on our graph. It's what's called the chemical shift. And again, if you want to know how that works, watch my earlier video. And we're basically, we can kind of cheat We've got a little table, and this is on your data sheet, if you do OCR, if you do any other course, you can probably get a very similar one. And we basically have, we'll get closer, we basically have all of the different environments on this uh, table here. So all I need to do is play snap. I need to look which of these looks most like one on there. And a little point, uh, between one and two there, you'll see it says HCR. That basically means HCC. I don't know why they put an R there. So let's have a look, let's play snap. Uh, where is uh, this here? This is a H attached to a C, attached to a C. So that's my between one and two. So I should expect this peak to appear roughly between one and two. And it is only roughly, it could be 2.4, it could be 0.8, uh, but roughly speaking, it should be around there. Um, here, I've got a hydrogen attached to a carbon, attached to a carbon, double bonded to an oxygen. Now this is the most difficult one for people to get right, because what happens is people say, all right, it's a H attached to a C attached to a C. So it must be one to two like this one, but it's not. Uh, the effect can travel over three bonds. So it's a H attached to a C attached to a C, double bonded to an O. And again, maybe if you get your data sheet out and pause, get your data sheet out and look at this, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, that would be between two and three at the bottom there. So this, uh, we should expect this to come up between two and three. And then finally, I've got a H attached to a C, double bonded to an O. Well, that's between nine and 10 there. So the first thing I've done is I've looked at my chemical shifts, whereabouts they're gonna appear. I then carry on my ribbon going down a little bit further. And the next thing we need to think about is something called the integration trace, uh, sometimes called the relative peak areas or relative peak sizes, but it should be areas really. Basically, the more hydrogens you have in this environment, the larger the area under your peak is going to be. Uh, sometimes people, and this is incorrect, sometimes people will say the peak will be bigger. Not necessarily, it won't be bigger, only it'll have a larger area underneath it. So let's have a look. How many hydrogens in this environment? Three. So this uh, peak will have a relative peak area of three. When we say relative, we mean relative to the other peaks. So this peak will have a size of two, and that peak will have a size of one. So the area under this peak will be three times the size of that peak. That's where the relative comes from. So that's dead, dead easy. As long as you can count, you can figure out the integration trace. We then carry on going down a little bit more, and we get to the hardest thing. This is what I imagine a lot of people will struggle with, and this is called splitting. So, I guess we start off with just a single peak, but our peak can get split 
into a series of smaller peaks depending on, and you're going to listen to this really carefully, depending on how many hydrogens are attached to the carbon next door. It's what we call an adjacent hydrogen. So uh, basically there's a table which you must memorise off the top of your head. Um, I call it the, well I don't call it, it is called the N plus one rule. If you have zero adjacent hydrogens, so no hydrogens on the carbon next door, your peak won't split, so you'll end up with one peak. A singlet, we call it. If I have one adjacent hydrogen, then N plus one, one plus one is two, we'll end up with our peak being split into two smaller peaks, and that's called a doublet. So a singlet would look like this, a doublet would look like that. Yeah, one adjacent hydrogen, we end up with two peaks, that N plus one rule. If I have two adjacent hydrogens, and I am going to go through examples of this in a second, uh, two adjacent hydrogens, N plus one, that means I'll end up with three peaks, and that's called a triplet. Now with a doublet, the peaks are both the same size. With a triplet, the middle peak is twice as big as the end peaks. And if you know anything about Pascal's triangle, you'll see where this is going. And if you don't, then just let it off by rope. If I have three adjacent hydrogens, n plus one, three plus one is four, that means we end up with four peaks, and we call that a quartet. If you're old, you might call it a quadruplet, but as youngins, we call it a quartet. And those peaks will have a ratio of one to three to three to one. So your two middle peaks are th roughly three times as big as your edge ones. Now, there is names for if you have four or more adjacent hydrogens, but we don't need to, you certainly don't need to know them for AS or A2. So if you have four or more adjacent hydrogens, we just call it a multiplet. And it resembles a hedgehog's back. Okay, just a bit of a mess. So if ever you just end up with a mess, you know you've got four or more adjacent hydrogens. So let's have a look what we've got. Uh, well, these hydrogens here, let's look at the carbon next door. The carbon next door has two hydrogens, so N plus one, two add one is three. That means I'm going to end up with a triplet. So this peak will be a triplet. Uh, here, I have three adjacent hydrogens on this side and one adjacent hydrogen on that side. Now, this is where we come to an extra little rule you need to learn. When we talk about the number of adjacent hydrogens, they must be hydrogens in the same environment. So, for example, these three hydrogens and these three hydrogens are in an identical environment. So if I was going to try and uh, look at the splitting of that hydrogen there, I would have three adjacent hydrogens here, three adjacent hydrogens here, that's six, add one, because it's n plus one, so I'd end up with seven peaks, which is a multiplet. But if ever your adjacent hydrogens are in different environments, no matter how many you have, you end up with a multiplet. So I've got uh, hydrogens on this side in one environment, hydrogens on that side in a different environment, that's adjacent hydrogens in two different environments. I don't even need to count them, I know it must be a multiplet. Okay, we're going to be going through, in fact, we're not going to be going through another example of that, so I'll go over that a little bit again. If you have adjacent hydrogens in different environments, you end up with a multiplet, no matter how many adjacent hydrogens you have. If, if these two hydrogens weren't there, I've got one hydrogen on this side, one on that side, that would not give me a triplet, that would give me a multiplet, because they're in different environments. And here I've got, uh, well this is my carbon the hydrogen's attached to, the carbon next door has got two hydrogens on, so that will give me a triplet, n plus one, that's three. So what will this look like on a graph? Roughly speaking, from nine to ten, we will have a small uh, triplet. It looks something like that. Uh, I've been a bit slack here as well. You've really got to make sure these peaks go down to the bottom. Don't do that. You won't get a mark for doing that. They go right up, then right down again. Uh, from two to three, I'm going to have a fairly big multiplet. Something like that. And from one to two, I'm going to have a fairly large triplet. Okay, roughly speaking. So that is what uh, this would look like. 
What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do, go through two more examples. The way I would do this for you is once I put up the question, I would pause the video, try and answer the question yourself, try and come up with a rough sketch of what it would look like, and then press play and uh, see if you got it right. And just remember this table there for splitting. Okie dokie. So my next molecule is... An ester, ethyl methanoate. Uh, stop the tape. Try and have a go at doing that, and then uh, start it again. Okay, I'll move out the way of the proton split. Okay, so here's how I would do it. A uh, circle of my environments. One environment there. A uh, second environment there, and well, a third environment there. Okay. So first thing we do is chemical shift. Let's get my sheet out again. Let's have a little look. Well, that's a H to a C to an R, so that's one to two. This is a H to a C to an O, so that's three to four. And this is a H to a C to a double bond O. That'll take precedence over um, the H to C to O. It will shift ever so slightly, but there's nothing else we can do about that. So H to C to an O, to an o is about nine to ten. Because this is also attached to so now in real life, that would get shifted uh, even more so, but we'll just leave it as that for now. Carry on our little ribbon. Let's look at my integration trays. We've got a 3 to a 2 to a 1, because that's how many hydrogens are in those environments. And then the hardest thing is splitting. Well, these hydrogens, I've got two carbons next door, so they'll be a triplet. These hydrogens have got three carbons next door, so they're a quartet. Uh, this hydrogen doesn't have any carbons, well, doesn't have any hydrogens on the carbon next door, so that will be a singlet. Okay, so roughly speaking, between one and two, we're going to have a big triplet. Uh, between three and four, we're going to have a fairly big quartet. And between 9 and 10, we're going to get a small singlet. So roughly speaking, ish, it would uh, look like that. Okay, we'll go through one more. Okay, and finally... Bit of a beast of a molecule there. Uh, have a go at this one, and then we'll go through it in a second. Okay then. Uh, so let's have a look what we got. Well, I've got one environment there, and all of these nine hydrogens are actually in an identical environment. This is what I was talking about earlier. You've really got to check that your hydrogens are in the same environment. If you look at these three. They're attached to exactly the same things as these three, and they're, again, attached to exactly the same things as these three at the top. These are identical. So I would put one big circle around all nine of these. So what's my chemical shift going to be? Let's have a look. Well, my carboxylic acid is from 11 to 12, and this is just uh, H to C to R, so that's going to be between 1 and 2. What's my uh, uh, integration trace or relative peak area? Well, that's going to be 9 to 1. And what is my splitting? Well, the carbon next door has no hydrogens, so that would be a singlet. And we'll talk about this more in a second, but that will be a singlet too, because there's no adjacent ones. Okay, so between 11 and 12, I'm going to have a small singlet. And between 1 and 2, I'm going to have a huge singlet. Something along those lines. Okay, kind of an interesting point um, about the OH here. OH is a little bit weird when it comes to spectroscopy. If we just have an OH when in alcohol, you'll see it appears of a very a wide range of um, chemical shifts. Then, if you can make that out, it's like somewhere between one and six, and that's obviously really annoying because loads of other stuff crops up between one and six. So it's very hard to determine what my OH is. 
Uh, and there is a way around that. I'm going to talk about that now. So basically, because uh, OH can hydrogen bond, it tends to have a very uh, large range. And that's a, a, a big, big problem. Uh, let's have a look at this molecule here. But we have got a, a few things which can help us out. This oxygen, all oxygens, and nitrogens as well, they kind of act as a roadblock for splitting. So uh, basically, an OH cannot cause splitting and it cannot get split. The oxygen stops splitting from getting past. So when you're counting your adjacent hydrogens, you can't count an OH or an NH. They, don't, they just don't count. Uh, and vice versa, an OH will not get split. You can't get past this oxygen. It blocks the splitting. So what this molecule would look like, well, we've got a, C to, a H to C to O, so that's between 3 and 4. We've got a H to C to R, so that's 1 and 2. And we've got, uh, basically, uh, OH, which can be anywhere between 1 and 6. However, well, integration trace is 3, 2, and 1. However, your OH will always be a singlet. You, can, you can't get an OH which is not a singlet. So one of the clues for which one is your OH is which one is the singlet. Uh, and that would be a quartet because it's got three adjacent hydrogens. And this would be a triplet because it's got two adjacent hydrogens. Okay. There is another way we can check for OHs as well, and that's using something called deuterium oxide. Deuterium oxide is D2O. Uh, it's basically, deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. It's just got one extra neutron. Uh, but deuterium does not show up on an NMR machine, so it won't cause a peak. It's what we call NMR invisible. Now, if I have you know, whatever, an OH there, and I have my deuterium oxide, my D2O, if I add D2O to my sample before I bung it in my machine, what happens is your deuteriums and any H's attached to an oxygen, and it only works for H's attached to oxygens, they swap over. And again, this is due, due to the fact that OH's can hydrogen bond, but CH's can't. And so what we'll end up with is that, and then this kind of goes off, does whatever, has a party, but we, we no longer have an OH peak because the deuterium has replaced it, and this does not show up on your graph. So if I had this molecule here, this is going to be a singlet between about 3 and 4, and this would have been a singlet between anywhere between 1 and 6. So I'll have a singlet between 3 and 4, and another singlet you know, between 1 and 6. If I added deuterium oxide, what would happen is this peak would disappear, because I no longer have my OH peak. So kind of two little tips to figuring out which is your OH. OHs are always singlets, and if you add D2O, your OH peak will literally just disappear. It will stop showing up, because you will no longer have an OH. It will go to an OD. Okay? Um, and that is NMR. If you look at my other video, I'm going to do one on how to answer the more longer questions involving mass spec, um, carbon NMR, and all that stuff as well. Okay, thanks.